Hello, this is Evan Rogerson, also known as Nine Mother Gang, and today I'm going to be breaking down the new Guide to Judging, which just came out. Um, it's June 17th at the time that I'm recording this. Kind of going to break this down similar to my game manual explanation for high stakes, so let's get right into it. First of all, new difference is this is officially the Guide to Judging for Vex AI. This is the new Guide to Judging, and I also have the old Guide to Judging pulled up right here. Um, this one does not have Vex AI, just because I guess Vex AI is going to be more prevalent this season, instead of added partway through. Um, so change log, we'll kind of get to those later. Um, an interesting thing is, and I have a Q&A on this right now, um, which is this section right here, which essentially says that if a update comes out and then there's a tournament within seven days of that update, you can use either version of the Guide to Judging. So my Q&A is asking, um, how will you know which Guide to Judging to use? Just because last year, things like the Innovate Awards form were added midway through the season. So things can change. Um, and then updates are going to be on the third Monday in the months of June, August, December, and April are the potential updates. Um, so introduction, you gotta, gotta follow the code of conduct, student-centered policies. Uh, there's a Q&A for judging. Um, to be considered for the Design, Excellence, and Innovate Awards at Worlds, you have to earn one of those awards at a world qualifying event, same as last year. Um, then this is new, just some key criteria. I think this is mostly just for judges who aren't familiar with VRC, just kind of some general terms. One of the interesting things here is the judges room is added and specifically identified. This has to be a separate room. I know tournaments I have judged it in the past just have the judges in the volunteer hospitality room. This needs to be a separate room now, so that's especially important for EPs or other people involved in planning roles. Um, I think that was the only thing there confidentiality judges can't talk about um, events that happen at the tournament so don't like ask them for questions impartiality um, judges are allowed to have conflicts of interest but they need to be managed in a specific way in order to ensure that things are all fair um, consistency you can't mix and match digital and physical notebooks at an event uh, have to give notebooks relatively the same amount of time and then the final decisions are qualitative not quantitative based off rubric scores um, you don't give out judged awards based on a team's performance award. Um, like if you don't give out pity awards or say this team is winning the tournament, we need to give them excellence. You don't do that. Um, you can't get more than one judged award. You have to make sure the t right team gets the right award. Um, and then youth protection judges shouldn't be alone with students. Um, teams need to be student centered. This is mostly just code of conduct stuff. Um, so judging roles. Uh, now this part is a little bit different right here. Um, the judge's advisor has no or minimal conflicts of interest. Um, if you look at the guide to judging from last year, it was just no conflicts of interest, not minimal conflicts of interest that you can see right there. Uh, that's really the only change that I noticed here. The VEX AI age requirements for judges are 21 like VEXU. They are not 18 like VRC, which makes sense because you can have university students, but it probably would be nice just from an EP point of view trying to get easier judges to be able to have judges who are like 19 years old judging the high school only VEX AI competitions. Um, this stuff's all pretty much the same. Event partner has to work with the judge's advisor. Um, recommended to have two judges for every eight to 10 teams at the event. So just some general roles. Event partner is required to get the judge's advisor and help get judges, um, work with the RSM to figure out like what judges award, set up a judging space, that sort of thing. Judge's advisor is kind of the head judge. They don't really be as involved with the judging process at larger tournaments. They're more just making sure that conflicts of interest are managed, making sure everything is followed properly in accordance with the guide to judging, um, collecting rubrics, that sort of thing. I mean, collecting notebooks. Um, they're mostly the go between between the judges and the event partner. So judges are the ones who are going out. They're getting interviews, they're grading the notebooks, they're watching matches, that sort of thing. Judges are supposed to do the judge advisor role. It's not required for local events, but I believe this is new the year. It is qualified, I mean, it is required for events that qualify teams for the VEX Worlds Championship, which is a bit of a pain for VEXU because almost every event qualifies for Worlds. Um, also makes hosting the state tournament a bit difficult as you might have to get all 10 judges or whatever in order to fill out the certification course and signature events. I could also see that being a bit of a hassle, but it's definitely something that I think is important to have for these Worlds qualifying events. And then, yeah, during the day, event partners, they're just supposed to make sure the judge's advisor has everything they need. They get their tournament manager printout, uh, make sure that nothing is obviously screwed up, like multiple teams getting judged award. I mean, one team getting multiple judged awards, judge advisor, they're kind of like managing all the stuff, and then judges are out there doing the judging. Um, this is just a general timeline thing. So then the section of awards, there's performance awards and judged awards, and then also like volunteer nominee awards, like volunteer of the year, mentor of the year. These aren't really real awards. These are the only ones that like teams are worried about getting. Um, so design award, 
this has changed slightly this year. It used, to, it used to say they have to be in roughly the top 30% of engineering notebook rubrics. This is now no longer a thing. The Excellence Award has changed slightly. It used to be the top 30% for qualifications, skills challenge, and autonomous programming skills, but now it is top 40%. RECF probably wasn't happy with the number of Excellence Awards not being handed out, so increase that. I don't really think there will be tournaments in which Excellence isn't handed out anymore. This definitely widens the gap a lot. And then events that have more than 10 middle school teams or and 10 high school teams are supposed to give out two Excellence Awards, and that's the same, and then you just round to the nearest 9.6 rounds up to 10 basic rounding rules you learned in elementary school. Innovate Award has changed slightly this year. They still have the form and everything. The big change here is this sentence. So the Innovate Award submission form is now placed behind your table of contents, not at the end of the engineering notebook. So I think that's a little interesting, um, but really shouldn't change anything. And also the Innovate Award, if you didn't already read the new qualifying criteria, is now a requirement at every single qualifying event. So. Any event that offers the Excellence in Design Award and Judges Award will now also be offering the Innovate Award. So now moving on, there are four other qualifying awards that can like qualify for worlds at bigger events or event region championships if you don't have a lot of events. That is the Think Award, Maze Award, Build Award, and Create Award. Now these awards have all changed. They now, as was stated in the qualifying criteria, require an engineering notebook. And they actually need to be fully developed engineering notebooks, but we'll kind of get to that later. And then they also have this line, so engineering notebooks is consistent with qualities demonstrated in the team interview and robot design. I was talking with some of the other judges who I know judge worlds, and the general consensus we reached is this is kind of making sure, is your notebook up to date? Like, if you're talking about having a catapult in your interview, but your notebook document's having a flywheel, that's a problem, that doesn't match, you're not going to be getting the award then. You're not going to meet these criteria. But other than that, Think Award, Amaze Award, Build Award, Create Award, they all seem to be relatively the same. I was kind of hoping like Think Award would focus on like programming in the notebook. Uh, Create Award would kind of focus on innovative concepts in the notebook, but they don't really do that. It just has to be fully developed and has to be up to date. Judges Award hasn't changed. Energy Inspire Sportsmanship haven't changed. And since these are not qualifying awards, they also aren't going to require engineering notebooks. So you can still win those awards. Then those are just kind of the individual awards like I was talking about earlier, but students don't really win these. Now, engineering notebooks, this has changed a bit. This whole like uh, six paragraph section is all new this year, so I'd recommend reading through it. Just kind of the brief justification of it is, so follow the code of conduct, adults can't work on the notebooks. Um, this section is kind of, make sure you cite your sources, which is definitely something they are going heavy on this year, is you need to have citations for all the sources in your engineering notebook. And this is also very important because it can be considered a violation of RCF code of conduct. So if you're not citing sources in your notebook, you can actually get like a G1 violation. So this is very important that anytime you have an outside idea in your engineering notebook, you need to cite your source. I think if that's the one takeaway you take from this new guide to judging, it is cite your sources on every single thing that you do. Um, it says, be it a website, book, video, or individual, or other team, you should probably credit the source of the information. So make sure at least like, if you're watching a YouTube video, I think it would be perfectly fine to say, hey, this is one, two, three, four, A's robot. Um, this is a cool flywheel. We're gonna put this on our robot. And then explain how you're using this information in the design process. So you can't just say like, uh, this is this is cool robot or hole counting. Um, like explain how you're incorporating it with your design process or else you could potentially get a G1. I don't know how strict that'll be. That'll probably be something that they cover more at some of their events like the EP Summit and stuff over the summer. They did that a lot, I think, either last year or two years ago um, with some of their changes. And then make sure that you organize it. And again, this is mostly just set your sources. And then this is also an interesting thing. And I'm just gonna read this verbatim because it's very important. Similarly, student programmers who make use of code libraries should cite their sources, explain what they changed and what they utilized, and ensure that they understand the programming they are using. Students should avoid using programs or code that are beyond their ability to create and explain independently. So if you're using a library, I would treat this as like a checklist. Make sure that all of these things are in your notebook because it could, could potentially be a code of conduct violation. So definitely make sure you explain this. I think this kind of answers some of the questions from a while ago of how do you handle libraries, and I think they did a pretty good job handling this. Um, and then as because I know this got discussed a lot in Vito, and someone sent an email to the Code of Judging. There was like a multi-thousand thread message going on about AI and notebooks. Uh, the bottom line is you can't use AI in notebooks. Um, and then just like don't be dishonest, I guess, because Code of Conduct. Um, this stuff is all pretty similar. So engineering is a requirement for all of these awards, and it's not a requirement for other awards. And then interview still goes to all the teams. You don't have to submit a notebook to get an interview. Um, remote judging stuff. So you can use computers, you can use physical notebook, whatever. 
Um, this stuff is all pretty similar. Just make sure that you like have these items in your notebook. Like you got pictures, you got CAD drawings, you got your table of contents, page numbers, chronological, all stuff that will come down in the rubric later on. Um, they said they modified this. Really, it all looks pretty similar to what it was last year. Just the basic notebook stuff. Then submission format, physical notebooks are to be handed in. This is all kind of rewritten and new. So physical notebooks are handed in and then they're given back to teams. You're not just supposed to um, throw them back into a public area. Yeah, it is not recommended notebooks be left unattended for teams to pick up. I know I've been to plenty of events that they're just like, hey, come to the inspection table. We have all the notebooks there. Um, I'm guessing somebody probably had an issue with their notebook getting stolen or something at an event. I don't know anything in particular, but that would just be my guess. So they're supposed to like return them to the pits and then digital notebooks have to be submitted through robot events. That's been a thing uh, in the past, but they did mention that they were codifying some of the Q and A's from last year into the guide to judging. And then additionally, judges are supposed to judge based on content, not like the level of beauty and how pretty the notebook is. Uh, sorry, all you people who spend five hours a day doing formatting. So similarly to before, they're still developing a fully developed. However, the criteria for fully developed has changed a bit over the past. Um, the absolute minimum for a notebook to be considered fully developed would be a score of two, proficient or expert in the first four category of the rubric. This is different than previous years. Yeah, so this is the guide to judging from last year. Fully developed would just be the first four criteria of the rubric, outlining the initial design process. Well, now it has to score at least two or higher. So before it would be, it was essentially just like, don't get a zero in the first four category, but now you have to get at least a two in the first four category. So just looking at some of the publicly available notebooks that I've judged on like speed booking and um, micro booking, which are under the live stream channel of the YouTube, I'd highly recommend you watch those if you want to see more about notebooking stuff. Um, there are definitely some notebooks that met the criteria for being fully developed under the old guides judging standards, but would now not be fully developed under these new standards, um, which I think just goes hand in hand with the excellence award. There's no 30% requirement, but now it's harder to be considered fully developed. And then you have to have a fully developed, so you have to be able to score at least a two in all of these sections, which we'll get to the rubric later in order to be considered for like the Amaze Award. So I definitely think, I mean, there's now seven awards that require notebooks. So I definitely think it'll be more common to see awards like maybe Create Award doesn't get handed out. I think that'll definitely be a lot more common this year. Um, just going back through editing here, I did forget one important thing. Only fully developed notebooks should be considered for any awards requiring a notebook. So this is the reason why like Amaze Award, because it does require a notebook, it must be a fully developed engineering notebook. So if you have a developing notebook that is literally useless, it's not going to help you with anything. Maybe like Judges Award, um, I guess it could be a factor because that's just whatever the judges want. But if you actually want to go for one of those qualifying awards, you need to make sure your notebook is fully developed. So you got to hit those first two points. Very, very important. And then fully no developed notebooks are ranked, same as before, except now there's a different rubric. And then you can kind of rearrange them based on qualitative judging after that. Um, and judges should grade the first few notebooks together so that they're all judging on roughly the same page. I like to have m at least multiple judges. And it says here, you should have at least two judges grade each fully developed notebook. And I think that's good. You should only be comparing judge scores from the same judges um, to compare because no judge is going to score the exact same. Team interviews. Now, I'll kind of skim over this stuff because these sections didn't really change. Team interviews need to be in a public area. Um, make sure that they're like student interactions. Students are giving a script. That it's not a pre-planned presentation. Um, judges can give follow-up interviews to teams that are in contention for judged awards. Judges need to be mindful of cultural differences, um, especially at like, um, big events like Worlds, multicultural ones. And then judges shouldn't use humor, that's all the same. Um, conducting team interviews still 10 to 15 minutes, open-ended questions. Uh, teams can use their associated equipment, like engineering notebook if they have it, programming code, robot obviously. Um, judges should be taking notes, then they'll fill out the rubrics afterwards. Judges should take pictures of the robot and team numbers, especially at larger events, to help them remember which one it is. Judges can leave missed notes to the teams, because um, every team needs to be able to get an interview. Yeah, it's just the initial interview. Ideally, at larger events, you'll have judges go back through and interview the top candidates. Um, and then judges kind of go back, they all kind of talk, um, figure out rankings and stuff, figure out which teams are going to be eligible for which awards, um, potentially do secondary interviews, potentially like, especially this year with notebook criteria, you'll probably be able to knock out a lot of teams for not meeting those notebook requirements. Um, and then deliberations, um, this is a handy way of doing things. You just put a post-it note up on the wall under each award for each single contendee, and then you just kind of narrow those down. Uh, Cross-checking award nominees, so like if you decide a team gets design award, you pull them down off of all the other ones beneath it. Um, you start at excellence, work your way down when you're going through these. Um, then, you, of course, for excellence, you need to get your qualification report because they need to be in like the top 40% of everything. And also, those can be a factor when you're deciding things, especially awards like Amaze and Think. Just kind of going through, marking out your teams, 
doing the shuffle down of awards as different teams win awards. If your team is a top contender for Think Award, but they end up winning the Design Award, obviously they don't get Think. Then you go and you enter those awards, destroy all the materials because confidentiality, uh, remote judging. So you can do like virtual interviews, virtual notebooks. Uh, notebooks are submitted through robot events. You can do not only robot events and then remote interviews. You can do those like Zoom. If you've gone to Worlds, you've done that before. Uh, remote judging protocols is pretty much the exact same, except student-centered. I mean, you can't just have one judge in there. And then no recording because you can't record during in-person interviews either. There's some general recommendations for judging with cycle times. Now getting on to the big, big changes is the engineering notebook rubrics and the interview rubrics. They have both changed. So here is the notebook rubric from last year. So you can see it was the innovation originality. Um, this one, I believe all of the publicly available notebooks that I have graded, um, I can't talk about ones from competition, but I believe all of those ones got a five. And it's essentially just you show end of evidence of independent inquiry from the beginning stages of the design process. It's like, essentially, as long as you have original ideas, you're going to get a five. It's really not hard. But now they've kind of upped the difficulty there. So notebook documents, whether this is implemented ideas, have their origin within the students on the team or if the students found inspiration elsewhere. I have another Q&A on this because that kind of sounds like you could get a five if you're citing your sources from outside. But this shows teams show evidence of independent inquiry for some elements of the robot design process. So I think what this is trying to say is you have to be coming up with your own ideas to score high and you have to be documenting coming up with those own ideas. If you're just saying, um, here's our three options on the decision matrix. We can whole count Ben Lipper, we can whole count China Robot, and we can whole count random RA3D we found. Um, that's that's not going to score you well here. That'll get you like really low score. So I think they're really trying to combat some of the China Robots, the Ben Lipper Robots for Vex IQ. So good stuff there. Kind of like that change. In the team interview, it used to be at a 40, now it's at a 45. It's just an entirely new section. So it's the creativity originality. And this is specifically for the Innovate and Create Award. Duh. This is something you should already be incorporating into your interview if you have an event that has Innovate or Create. But now every event has Innovate, so this should be in your interview anyway. You're essentially just describing creative aspects of your robot with clarity and detail. One thing I would like to point out is team can describe a creative solution. So this is singular in the two to three, then the expert has the parentheses S. So I would recommend describing multiple creative aspects if you really wanna get into the expert category, which you do. So it's just essentially just like describing stuff that would be a requirement for the Create and Innovate Award. Uh, pretty similar stuff if you've already tried to get those awards in the past. And those are kind of all of the big changes here. Overall, I'm a pretty big fan of all the changes here. I'm not so sure about the 40% for excellence. I kind of like the 30%. And then I just would have appreciated something with like top five. Like I believe it used to be top five or top 20%, whichever one is larger. Kind of like that. Really wish they hadn't expanded that. But at least it's a bit harder to be fully developed now. So I think that kind of counters it out. I won't know exactly, of course, until I've competed and judged. And then overall, I think it's pretty good stuff. They're definitely, I feel like the big thing here is just trying to stop people from copying robots like now you have to be citing your sources there's an entirely new section on the interview and the and notebook about making sure you're original um they're threatening code of conduct violations if you aren't just citing your sources so i think that's really the big thing here big takeaway is make sure you have like your sources make sure you're being original and creative um, which overall i think that's pretty good and then of course just the resources note taking stuff excellence criteria innovate award and then just like your posters to hang up in the judging guide for easy and quick access but overall pretty happy with the guys judging update curious to see what they change in their updates throughout the season 